I'm Lourdes Lopez. I'm the executive director of Morphosis The Wielden Company. I started dancing when I was five and a half because I had some orthopedic um, issues. I was pigeon toed and uh, flat footed and had, didn't have calf muscles, and that was in Miami. And by the age of eight, orthopedic shoes came off, and I remember my parents saying, um, well, we can't really afford these classes. Do you want to keep going? I said, yes. So they put me with a um, Russian teacher named Alexander Nigodov, who actually taught me that these steps had um, these steps had names to them, and these ballets existed for and three acts, one leg, sleeping beauty, and all of a sudden taught me the history of dance, and I think I was, it, it caught on, I got the bug. At the age of 10, I went to New York, and I was given a scholarship with Joffrey, and I studied there for that summer. And then the following summer, got a scholarship with the School of American Ballet, and um, would go to New York every summer until the age of 14 when they asked me to stay. Um, I then moved to New York at 14 with my sister who was 19 and we lived by ourselves and I studied at School of American Ballet for about a year and a half and at 15 and a half got into the company as an apprentice and then at 16 as a full-fledged company member with New York City Ballet. And here I am. <laughs> uh, my orthopedic issues, I don't really, re I don't re remember them whether they were an obstacle. You know, at, at five you don't you're not focused on that. Um, it didn't mean, I, all I knew is that I was wearing orthopedic shoes, but I, I never thought that I would be a professional dancer. I was never thinking, oh, because I have this, I won't ever to dance. In fact, I don't think I ever understood that I could actually make a career out of dance until I was about 14. Um, I you know, grew up in Miami, Florida, and we would watch these dancers come in every, you know, once, once a year, I think, or twice a year as international ballet artists, and they would do, you know, sort of like a mixed, program of pas de deux, but I never quite understood that there were specific companies and that you could actually get paid and you had benefits and there was a theater and you know that just didn't enter my mind until much later. I really think that my generation was incredibly lucky because we worked with um, George Balanchine and Jerome Robbins and really at that point there were the two geniuses of 20th century classical dance. I mean, there were other geniuses like Martha Graham and Merce Cunningham. Uh, but in terms of the classical vocabulary, those were the two that were um, really the most. And my career spanned 24 years with New York City Ballet, so I was, I was able to work with both and, and be created by both those choreographers. And it was interesting because there were very they were very, very different individuals. They basically got the same result from a dancer, but in very, very different ways. Um, Jerome Robbins was a taskmaster and, and not always, um, not always very nice. And, and um, you know, not that he was brutal, but it, there was a, a tension in, in rehearsals and in these uh, dress rehearsals. And he did it all because he just wanted, when that curtain came up, for you to be as you know, the best that you could possibly be. And he was exact, uh, he, you needed to move like he said, and an arm had to be exactly how he wanted it, and the, the step had to be exactly on the timing that he wanted it. And Balanchine, Mr. B, was just the complete opposite. You know, he was just incredibly respectful and nice, and if you couldn't do the step, he'd happily change it for you, and it wasn't, he really wanted, he wanted the artist to come out, so he gave you a foundation or a guidelines which were the choreography and the steps, and then he just wanted to see what you did with it. I mean, that's what was exciting to him. Balanchine and Robbins are called the geniuses of 20th century um, ballet, but um, the, the foundation is a classical vocabulary. In other words, they use the classical training, they use the point shoe, um, but they clearly were pushing it into the 21st century. Rather, they took 19th century dance and made it into 20th century. And now what needs to happen is that 20th century dance, which is Robbins and Balanchine, and you know, um, who else? Elliot Feld and Twyla Tharp and, and Bill Forsyth have to be, have to, someone has to now move dance into the 21st century, still using the classical foundation, which is just the classical training. And, and I think I'm basically talking about the point shoe and the ability to turn out and, um, and you know, the line, the aspects of a line when, when a dancer is on stage. And I, that's what I mean by classical. The progression, I think, has, has um, I call it flatlined a little bit because there was so much innovation going on in the 1940s and the, actually the 1950s and 60s in terms of dance, whether it was modern or, or classical. 
And we've reached a point, I think, I've seen it, where um, it's kind of status quo, where the dance world, the, um, the ballet companies, the classical ballet companies are kind of working in a bubble by themselves in a theater, then the modern dance companies are working in another bubble, and there's, there's no interaction of ideas or energy or support or collaboration. It's, it's, it's become very separated and, um, and um, uh, segregated, basically. So, you know, how do you change that? Um, well, you, if you're a ballet company, you look outside of your world and you get a, a visual artist who um, is a contemporary visual artist, or you get a designer who um, designs costumes for theater, or you get, so you, you just kind of, it's, it's like, um, um, it's more like the melting pot theory. You know, the, the more different aspects that you add to it, the, the more exciting the product, the stronger the product is. Um, that's going to come out of it, and I just think also for artists, you, the minute you're in a bubble, you're, I think you're, you're dead, you're, because you have, you're, that's how you get your inspiration from watching other people, from information from other people. I mean, it's all about information. It's interesting because I think, I think New York City Ballet was because it was run or headed by a genius even though it was all his choreography, and I, and I don't think I'm biased when I say this, um, no two Balanchine ballets are alike. You, you can't compare Agon to Serenade, and you can't compare Serenade to Apollo. And so with him as the main choreographer somehow feeding these dancers and feeding, um, it was, we didn't lack for creativity. And, you know, Balanchine came from an era that you, with in terms of the Ballet Russe, that he really did work with Picasso, and and, um, and uh, you know, Chagall and Stravinsky and Prokofiev. Um, so he, un he understood that. And he, you know, what was interesting about Balanchine is that a lot of the music that he chose was music that was never choreographed, that no one, it wasn't Chopin and it wasn't Delibes, and I mean, though he has those, some of those ballets to those composers, but he, you know, it's Hindemith and Webern and, and Stravinsky and, you know, he, he really, he really looked outside the norm, and I and I think that's that's another kind of creative collaboration. With Robbins, what he brought to the to New York City Ballet is the fact that he was in on Broadway, and so he had a whole nother idea and scope of, of how to move and and of American dance, and um, I mean you know try to bring in Bernstein and Copeland and choreograph to to the to that music. So it. Um, those years, there wasn't that much outside collaboration. You know, we didn't have visual artists coming in and designers, um, but the choreographers themselves were innovative and, and, and looking outside their world. I think technology is going to be a huge aspect outside for dance. Um, I think number one, you're going to be seeing video and film used a lot more during performances of of dance, though one has to be careful because the two of them can really visually compete in terms of the audience and where the where the focus is. But I think it's moving into a direction where people people are, want to experiment, and I think that's important. Whether it's right or wrong, it's the idea is just to take the chance and do it. I think in terms of video, I, my personal belief is that dance is a is a, an art form that's handed down, and while I can download a um, a dance you know, from YouTube and learn it in a studio, there is nothing like having the actual person in front of you um, because you have to realize it's, um, you know, we, the art form is having people watch you. A musician can kind of tape something or record something and then listen to it and, and see where he's made the mistakes. A dancer can't quite do that. So I think in terms of teaching it won't, it's, it's not going to help that much, but I think in terms of the actual performances, on the stage, I think it'll be a very exciting addition uh, to dance, video and film.